Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome to the Morning Devo with Bowo. This is August 8th, 2022. We are in chapter 6 of Judges, uh, kind of going through the second part of this chapter uh, about this this dude Gideon. So yeah, it'll be pretty cool to go through it with you. Um, you could always check out the archives at my YouTube channel. Just type in my name. I know it's a weird spelling, but if you could type it in and get there, then you can get all the devos, right? Tons of them. And you could also go, um, you could subscribe. And that way, if I do any new devos, any devotions, you could always check them out. So these are my devotions, time where I get in the word. But certainly, I love to uh, have the church join me in going through the devotions anytime. And, uh, and that's what we do here on uh, this channel. So glad you're with me. And Marsh is already in. So I'm super stoked. Marsh is an awesome sister in the Lord. And uh, what a blessing to have her uh, in the house of devotion this morning. So chapter six of Judges. Let's kind of get into this. And, you know, I really recommend for anybody who's reading um, kind of the narrative of, of Gideon to read all the chapters together uh, that, that that mention Gideon, um, simply because um, it, it's a very very interesting story when you take it all, kind of all the big picture, if you will, of his his life. You know, a person who's doesn't think much of himself. Um, you know, meaning when God does call this guy. Uh, to be a judge, right? A, a kind of military commander of Israel to to go up against the enemies of Israel. And uh, this guy's response is, I am the least in my entire family. This is in verse 15 of chapter 6. And uh, he says, my family is the poorest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. So, man, this guy really saw himself his family just in a lowly state you know not not really uh you know the proud person not the person who's like man that's right god's called me i'm gonna go do it uh super reluctancy um in uh his response to uh the angel of the lord of all people uh we've gone through the bible now and the angel of the Lord, you know, so far, the angel of the Lord, someone pretty special, right? Person, yeah. And uh, the angel of the Lord appears to him, and yet he's still super reluctant. And it makes me think that, hey, you know, don't let my reluctancy be the marker for how God could use me. You know, sometimes that's how it is in people's lives. They think, hey, I'm reluctant. Maybe God's not going to use me. No, maybe God's going to use you powerfully because you are reluctant, because you are a little, hmm, if you will, you don't think much of yourself. But you know what? You're willing to, to hear what God has to say about you or what God's going to do in your life. And that's important, right? We might not think much of ourselves, but... You know, let's let's not do that to the point where we're not open to potentially what God can do in your life, and uh, and that's important. You know, sometimes it's in the weakest times that we're the most strongest, and in if you will, Christ's light shines through us. And so, Gideon, interesting, but. You know, he gets raised up to this amazing place of being a judge. And then in the latter narrative of his life, we'll, we'll, we'll get there this week, I, I think, Lord willing. Um, we kind of see, you know, where he's at, you know, um, not much better off, you know, very interesting, right? Very, a lot of, lot of struggles uh, after all the victories. Hmm, interesting, right? After all the victories, still struggling? Wow, how interesting. Um, so whereupon the Lord said to him, this is verse 16, but I, Jehovah will be with you and you shall quickly destroy the Midianite hordes. So that's what the angel of the Lord responds to Gideon's declaration of his weakness with say, hey, man, I'm going to be with you, man. We're going to do it. You know, um, and it says, all right, the angel agreed. I'll stay here and tell um, or well, Gideon replied, if it is really true that you are going to help me like that, then do some miracle to prove it. Hey, have you ever wanted God to do some kind of miracle to prove it? 
to kind of prove that, hey, are you with me, God, in this? Prove it. Show me. You know, kind of interesting, huh? A lot of us as human beings have that kind of thought when it comes to God, when it comes to the deity. Hey, prove it. Show yourself. And it's interesting that, you know, when I was reading the Bible, uh, you know, as a late teenager, I was kind of surprised about Gideon. I was kind of surprised that Gideon was a, you know, a guy that was kind of like me. You know, he was a person who seemed so fragile and seemed so unfaithful, you know, in, 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 in the way he talked about God or, and to God. Um, he didn't seem a very, you know, filled with this amazing faithful strength or anything like that. Or, or maybe just that his faith was seen in in a really unique way of this way of saying, "Hey God, I don't, I, I, I kind of need to know you're with me. I'm, um, you know, I'm, you know, there's an enemy out there, and 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 I'm scared of that enemy, and I'm I'm like, you know, threshing the wheat in the wine press, man. I'm I'm I don't want to go up on the high hill because, man, what if I get up on the high hill and they see me, you know?" I, I'm not into that. I'm scared. And, and it's interesting that, you know, he he is in this dialogue with God. And you would think God might be like, well, you're not of great faith. Forget you. But it's not like that at all in this narrative at all. You know, sometimes pastors and everybody want to be the strong, want to be the 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 faithful, you know, but maybe the faithful looks a little different than what you think you know and you know would Gideon be an elder in your church would Gideon be an elder you know good question right would you put Gideon as a leader uh, here he is he says hey you know if you're really God why don't you do a miracle and prove it prove it that it's really Jehovah who is talking to me right and stay here until I get a present for you <laughs> right and he says, all right, the angel agreed. I'll stay here until you return. And Gideon hurries home, right? And he carries all this meat in this pot and he takes it to the angel who's beneath the oak tree and presented it to him. And the angel said to him, place the meat on, and the bread on the rock over there and pour broth over it. Some kind of soup, right? And then Gideon had to follow these instructions or when he did, the angel touched the meat and the bread and with his staff, so interesting, right? With his staff, like a walking staff, I guess, right? And fire flamed up from the rock and consumed them. And suddenly the angel was gone, right? So a very kind of Moses feel for the angel, right? Having a, a staff, a, you know, obviously it was probably a large staff, maybe like a shepherd's staff, right? The Lord is our what? Shepherd. That's kind of interesting thought too. But notice a flame came up from the rock and consumed them, uh, which, which is just an interesting idea, right? Flame up from the rock and consumed them, and suddenly the angel was gone. It's interesting, out of the rock river flows in the book of Exodus, and Gideon out of the rock, what? Fire flows. Wow, very interesting. The Bible tells us that the rock is Christ. The rock is Messiah. Very interesting. Uh, in the New Testament, there's a statement that Paul the Apostle makes about the rock, the rock of the Old Testament, the rock where water poured out. That rock is Christ, right? The water flows, the fire flows, I guess, you know, the, the holiness, the purity. Um, but Gideon realized that it had been, it had intended to be the angel of the Lord, or when, when, he, when he realized that it had been the angel of the Lord, he cried out, Alas, Lord God, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. So very big deal. A lot of history with the angel of the Lord and Israel. You could look it up. Exodus 23, I think 23 is a great place to look up. But you'll see that the angel of the Lord was with Israel for a long, long time. And Gideon built an altar there and named the altar Peace with Jehovah. The altar is still there in Oprah, in the land of the uh, Abrazites. That night, the Lord told Gideon to hitch his father's best ox to the family altar of Baal. Now, this has to be one big altar of Baal to 
to hitch an ox up to it to take it down. So it says, pull it down and cut down the wooden idol of the goddess Asherah that stood nearby. So it's interesting. What does God do um, after Gideon's on board? He says, hey, you're on board with, with me? Okay, let's start tearing down the idols. Wow, isn't that cool? It's great to be tearing down the idols. Janice, very good having you in the house today. Um, but I love that. You know, you come into a relationship with God, and then what does God start doing? Tearing down my idols. Start taking down things that I have over the years erected, right, in life and built up, you know, things that are about me or whatever it is, all those idols. So the Baal idol in the family, the Asherah idol in the family. God says, hey, Gideon, you know, get out the car, wrap the, the you know, get the strap, put it around the hitch and hook it up to those those things. And I want you to take those things out, pull them down, remove them. You know, that kind of idea. It reminds us a lot of Jesus' words about removing areas of sin in our life, right? Um, dealing with those things. And so we see a real illustration of it with Gideon right here. And he says, replace it with the altar for the Lord, your God. So it's great. Don't just remove, but replace. That's a good idea today, right? This morning. Don't just remove, but replace. So don't just tear down, but fill in, right? Fill in with something, something good, something that, hey, you know, that something that's positive for me, you know, something that makes me, you know, think of God, worship God, um, you know, draw close to God, those kind of things. Um, so replace with, you know, it, the altar of the Lord. And, uh, and it says, and it lay the stones carefully. Uh, those are very interesting in the book of Exodus, I think it was, about how to build these altars, right? It wasn't to be elaborate. God didn't want his, his altars to be elaborate, but just be very plain, if you will, very earthy, right? Not, not about human endeavor. He doesn't want his altar to be like that. And, uh, and so he does that. And uh, then they sacrifice, it says, a burnt offering, which is a dedication offering uh, to the Lord using the wooden idol as wood for the fire on the, on the altar. Isn't that cool? The wooden idol is the wood on the sacrifice. Wow, really interesting, right? Jesus is our burnt offering. He is the, the offering that goes up. He is the one who is up, you know, exalted in a sense lifted up from the earth and what's what's underneath him oh all of us idolaters Ooh, what a picture right and it says so gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the lord had commanded but he did at he did it at night for fear of the other members of his father's household and for fear of the men of the city for he knew what would happen if they found out who did it Early the next morning, as the city began to stir, someone discovered that the altar of Baal was knocked apart. The idol beside it was gone, and a new altar had been <laughs> built instead of what remain uh, with the remains of the sacrifice on it. So it's very cool, right? Gideon, you know, you still see his 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 timidity, right? Where he goes, "Hey, I'm going to do this, but it's going to be at night. You know, that way, no one no one sees it. I don't get in trouble." And everybody gets up in the morning and they see what he's done. He's been up all night. He's been working the midnight shift, so to speak. And he's just, he's been, you know, messing with these idols and building a new altar. Wow. Talk about what a night, right? Talk about being busy uh, in the, the, the late hours, you know, Gideon was. But notice, it's not like he just does it in the day. Even though he knows God's with him, he still is reluctant to do it in the day, right? And they say, who did this? Everyone demanded. Finally, they learned it was Gideon, the son of Joash. Bring out your son, they shouted uh, to Joash, for he must die insulting the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asherah pole idol. Man, can you believe just where we get sometimes in idolatry? We're so wrapped up <clears throat> that we're so bummed when our idols are gone, right? Uh, have you ever been that way where you're kind of bummed your idol's gone? 
you know, that idol that you love so much, that thing that you love so much, that now that it's gone, it's like your whole world is, is over, you know, it's all done, there's no hope, you know, oh man, is God stripping us of those things, right, wanting us to see him as greater, more powerful, better, you know, than all those things, all those things we cling to so, so easily, right, uh, you know, the New Testament tells us in the book of Hebrews, right, to remove every weight and sin. I love that word weight, you know, that idea of just things that weigh you down, right? Things that just hinder, hinder. It's like a backpack with all kinds of weight on it, you know. And wow, what a trip, huh? To remove that weight, right? It's not necessarily something that maybe is sinful, but it's weight, right? It's kind of weighing you down. And it takes some discernment, some real thought in our life, um, and some writing, you know, to really write those things out, right? It's not, it's not an easy process, and it's a continual process in our life. There's no doubt about it. But here these people are clinging to their idols, and God's still using Gideon, even though he's so the way Gideon is. Isn't that interesting? God's still using you the way you are. Interesting, right? Yeah, you know, people might say, well, the reason why God's not using you is because you're, you're, you're fearful. You're very full of, you're, you're timid. That's why God won't use you. Mm, wrong, right? God used Gideon, right? He was pretty timid. He's pretty scared, you know, but God used him. Yeah, so, you know, sometimes we say things that just mm, aren't quite fully true, right? Yeah. But Joash reported to the whole mob, Does Baal need your help? What an insult to a god. <laughs> so so his dad, Gideon's dad, kind of comes to this like philosophical thought. Like, man, why do you have to fight for Baal? Like in the sense that, you know, why do you have to stand up to Baal? If Baal's, you know, if Baal's real and all that, and Ashereth, why don't, why don't they, you know, why do you have to contend for, with them? you know, or for them on their behalf. Does Baal need your help? What an insult to a god. You are the ones who should die for insulting Baal. Uh, meaning you guys are insulting Baal. You're saying that he can't fight his own fight, so to speak. Man, you're, so he kind of he does some really cool, you know, intellectual talking to them. And I love that. Sometimes we have to respond to people with great intellectual debate and dialogue you know and logic right to help people see their flaw hey why are you so mad why are, why do you want to kill him you know can't Baal do his own thing you know maybe Baal's offended that you are fighting for him you know maybe Baal can do it on his own you know so it's neat that he he throws in this kind of argument to the people and it's always good for us to um, you know, just be ready and always be very, um, you know, listening very well and trying to work through different arguments um, in our minds. Sometimes when we're thinking, sometimes we're thinking about, hey, what does this make sense? You know, what's an argument against it? What's an argument for it? But we're thinking through those things. We're kind of doing some brain power, you know, and he does this. And it says, if Baal is really your God, let him take care of himself and destroy the one who broke apart his altar. From then on, Gideon was called Jerubbabal, uh, a nickname meaning let Baal take care of himself. Now, this, this let Baal take care of himself literally is, quote, let Baal bring charges. Or it could be used mockingly as well, let Baal be honored. So... It sounds a little, of course, like a mocking statement, right? But this becomes the nickname of Gideon, Jerub Baal, Jerub Baal, Jerub Baal. Say that a lot fast, right? Um, so it's the nickname. It's like, hey, let Baal bring the charges. You know, that's who we're going to call. Who's going to fight our battle? Jerub Baal. Yeah, really cool. Soon afterward, the armies of Midian, er Amalek, and other neighboring nations united in one vast alliance against Israel. They crossed the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. 
Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Another area where we see coming upon. Very cool. The Spirit, and again, the Spirit has a work in the Old and the New Testament. Um, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet as to call to arms. And the men of Abizer came to him and sent messengers throughout Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, summoning their fighting forces, and all of them responded. So unlike Deborah and Barak, where they, they didn't have many people come to their rescue at all to help the tribes, that is the brothers, you know, the tribal brothers. Here we see that, that Gideon announces, blows the trumpet years and years later from Deborah and Barak, and the other tribes respond. They're ready to go. Then Gideon said to God, if you are really going to use me to save Israel as you promised, prove it to me in this way and I'll put some wool on the threshing floor tonight. And if in the morning the fleece is all wet and the ground is dry, I will know you are going to help me. And it happened just that way. When he got up the next morning, he presented the fleece together and wrung out the whole bowl, bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to the Lord, Please don't be angry with me, but let me make one more little test, right? This time let the fleece remain dry while the ground around it is all wet. So the Lord did as he asked, and that night the fleece stayed dry, but the ground was covered with dew. Now we're going to see why God uses Gideon maybe tomorrow in such a powerful way. It seems to us like Gideon's just such an interesting guy, such a quirky guy, right? And, uh, and he keeps testing God, right? You know, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, right? We would think of that and we go, never, 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 don't do that, right? And here Gideon is, is doing this kind of thing that we think would be so wrong, right? But yet the angel of the Lord is totally with Gideon. The spirit of the Lord comes upon him. He's taken steps of faith, right? It's not that he's absent from steps of faith at all in his life. No, it's not like he's saying, oh God, I don't, uh, you know, uh, I don't love you at all. I hate you. And, you know, if you're really real, right, you know, uh, magic marker in the sky. It's not, it's not something ridiculous and, you know, just, just incoherent, you know, um, but you see, Gideon does make these steps of faith. And there are these ones where he takes a step and then he's like, where am I at? What's the ground am I on? Is it, is it, it feels shaky. I don't feel comfortable in this setting. And he has to ask God for something and God moves him forward a little more. And Gideon takes another step and he feels a little shaky now on that new ground, right? And, he, and he's taking those steps. I want you to see that, you know, in our life, it's like that. I'm taking these steps and they're slow steps. And then I stop and I'm kind of shaky with that new step. And I need, you know, I need God to, to show me that, Hey, I'm okay. It's like, I'm okay where I'm at now. And as that happens, I get to take another step. And, you know, God just continually works with us in all of our idiosyncrasies and all our quirkiness. And, and it's just unreal. And how should I treat other people in their quirkiness and in their oddities? You know, what should I be like to them? You know, if God's treating me so beautifully gracious and merciful, you know, in all of my weirdness, maybe I need to think of that with other people. Maybe I not not to be so harsh in, in many ways, but instead be willing, you know, to to use my intellect and 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 enter into conversation and and maybe even you know be tolerant you know and and have some tolerance you know and i'm not talking about some tolerance where we ignore things everything but i'm talking about some level of tolerance right where where god tolerated you know gideon and and maybe i need to tolerate some other people and uh, knowing that there's a bigger picture you know getting into their lives learning more about them you know um, and that takes difficult conversations, conversations that aren't the easiest to have, but they're worth it, you know, uh, for the salvation of the soul, right? They're worth it. So very cool area of scripture with Gideon, a lot of sh uh, showing of his, his weaknesses, but yet God is with him, taking him a step further every time. And we're going to see just how this thing goes. Okay. So you guys have a great day. Glad you enjoyed the thoughts. 
And I hope some of them just stay with you today. Remember, just as God worked with Gideon, so God's working with you too. Okay? Bye-bye.